All right, let's get this show on the road. <laughs> Hi there, and welcome to Accidental Origin, the weekly web writing show. And I'm going to go to phase transition. Boom. Hi, Hi there, y'all. Um, yeah. So, my name is Brendan. This is actually on Origin. Um, tell you a little bit about what's going on. Uh, so, this week, uh, I have started a game design competition called Game Chef. And uh, I thought, while originally I wasn't going to do it, uh, I was going to keep it on with a short story, I thought it would actually be more fun and uh, keep things interesting for us if I just did the, the game design stuff on stream. Um, I've gotten a bit of feedback lately from some of my friends and viewers uh, about uh, that I, I'm super serial all the time, I'm super serious, and uh, I, I, I might be, I might come across as trying a little bit too hard, which is fine. I mean, that's what, that's what feedback is for, right? So uh, I didn't really plan much for this week. Uh, like, I didn't sit down and, and, and knock out a lesson plan sort of thing. I'm, I'm kind of winging it. Uh, and it feels like I'm winging it, at least at the moment. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, we're going to talk game design. Uh, when I was at the convention a few weeks ago, for those of you who are here for that, uh, I took... I spent three hours and did, like, a game design role-playing game design workshop with a local designer by the name of Jason Pitt. Um, he's a cool guy. Um, he's won some awards and stuff in the role-playing game community. Um, and yeah, uh, I learned a lot. Uh, and we're going to talk about some of that stuff. So cool. All right. So let's start. We're going to go to here. Uh, no, sorry, this one. Cool. It's a studio. Uh, so this is the game design competition that, that I'm working on. <laughs> um, so yeah. Uh, we... It's a analog role-playing game, uh, or an analog game design, not a video game. And, um, sorry, chat. Uh, and it's kind of interesting because it, um, it's kind of interesting because it has a theme, gives you four ingredients, and uh, it's like a nine day thing. So it's like very short, uh, it's gonna be this episode, and I believe the last day will be, yeah, it's the Monday after the next episode. So I'm probably gonna spend two episodes on it. Uh, so yeah. So cool. Um, so the theme for this year, I don't know why it says 2015 there, uh, because the, it, it's actually 2016, uh, but the theme for this year is technology, um, which is cool. Uh, a lot of the times um, when we talk about technology, we're, we're talking about computers. We're talking about uh, current modern day technology. But that's not what technology has to mean. I mean, technology has kind of shaped society for a long time. The wheel is technology. Fire is technology. And that's really what this theme is about. It's about uh, changing the way that we think about things. Um, advents in engineering, advents in thinking. Um, so cool, technology. 
And then the four ingredients, which we got here. I'm actually going to pump this up a bit. Let's go. Zoom. There we go. That's more readable. Um, so yeah, the ingredients for this year are alarm, dance, sketch, and sunlight. Um, which all have interesting connotations. And, and part of the, the challenge of this, this competition is that uh, it is a... Um, you're supposed to interpret. You're supposed to interpret. So, yeah. And I mean, uh, chest dagger. Uh, technology can totally be a theme. Uh, thematics are some of the like most inter in intricate and, and the hardest to define things about writing. Um, so technology can totally be a theme. And I mean, in terms of game design, uh, it, it's not even that I necessarily would call it a theme, but they're calling it a theme, so it's the theme. <laughs> uh, but yeah, thematics uh, themes can be can be pretty much anything. Uh, yeah, I had a full thought there. I don't know where it went, but that's fine. Um, so yeah, uh, I'm just scrolling down the rules here, trying to give you guys a general overview of what's going on. Uh, so there is a big, a big thing about accessibility. Uh, your design should be accessible for everybody, especially uh, blind, deaf, or colorblind uh, people. Uh, submission stuff, 4,000 word limit, um, various submission and intellectual property stuff. Cool. We all get the idea? Yeah. So, uh, I have, they, we're now approximately two days into the competition, um, and yes, Johnny, it is a Super Mario themed shirt. Um, <laughs> I'm two days in, so I have actually spent a uh, good deal of yesterday thinking about uh, my concept for the game. So like I did with uh, the short story writing, I'm kind of going to show you my thoughts uh, on, on, on this whole thing. Yeah, uh, so there is a word limit. It's a analog game. So it's actually about writing a set of rules. Uh, most of the designs that come through the, this competition are role-playing game designs, specifically narrative role-playing game designs. So storytelling games, kind of like in the style of Fiasco, or um, uh, Dungeon World, or that kind of stuff, Apocalypse World. Um, it's not a hard limit. Uh, there's a 4,000 word limit. Uh, but you can submit more. It's just one of those things where the judges aren't guaranteed to go over... Um, the judges aren't guaranteed to go over anything above 4,000 words. So. <laughs> yeah. Um. What am I thinking? Oh, right. Sorry. Um. Yeah. Looking through my notes. Look at this page. Oh. Man, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that it's, it's buffering and all that stuff. Um, yeah, there's not much I can do about it right this second. Um, uh, my internet is doing significantly better. I'm getting the least amount of frame drops I've ever had. Uh, so, yeah. Um, yeah, okay. Right. Um, this, this is why I plan things. This is why I plan things. Um, so, I've been thinking a lot, a lot about Zork lately. 
Uh, me and my friend Sam uh, have been discussing it a lot. It, it kind of came up a few times this week. So I've been thinking about Zork. And we were talking about MUDs in general and things like maps and map making and, and, and how difficult it is to figure out those kind of worlds. So for me right now, I'm kind of interested in map making, um, which is awesome because for the theme of this, for the theme of this game design competition technology, uh, I'm going to use cartography as my technology. Right? So, we're going to write that down. And, cartography. Oh, sorry, cartograph. So, we're going to talk about map making um, and, and stuff similar to that. All right, what we got? Cool, cool. Right, so map making. And the reason I went with map making, A, because of technology, B, because of Zork, and C, because it actually deals with one of the ingredients. Uh, it actually, it, it deals with sketch. So cartography, for me, sketching, a map. So that's my key ingredient here. And um, in that vein, we have to give the players a reason for sketching the map. Um, and I think that reason, um, oh, I'm skipping steps, I'm skipping steps. Sorry about my thought process. So when you talk about sketching a map for me, I'm reminded of games like Zork, like the old fighting fantasy style games, um, which are awesome, because those I, I, I absolutely love Steve Jackson's like fighting fantasy game books, which are basically like a role playing game in a book, choose your own adventure style. Um, they're hella fun, uh, and if you never check them out, you should. Uh, <laughs> and, and exactly, um, Zorik draws heavily on D and D stereotypes, and, and Dungeons and Dragons deal crazy with with. Uh, map making. Uh, in fact, a lot of the move sets in Dungeons and Dragons, uh, <laughs> a lot of Dungeons and Dragons stuff actually like deals with specifically like your bow can shoot this many squares, uh, this many meters, and, and you can measure that in squares and stuff. Uh, and, and exactly. Um, so the game I kind of want to make is is that kind of style game where the players literally take turns making the map, building onto the map, and build this whole bigger picture of, of what's going on. Uh, so yeah, I, that's kind of the style of game I'm, I'm looking for uh, right now for, for this. Um, so yeah. Uh, yeah. So, what else we got? Um, as usual, my thought process eludes even me. Um, so cartograph. The other thing, uh, the other kind of stuff that I would like to include, uh, but don't necessarily need to include is I'd be interested um, let's do uh, wants not needs let's do that. Uh, 
So I would like this to have a single player mode. Um, mostly because if, if you're like me, uh, a lot of good role playing games involve a group and groups are hard to organize, uh, especially around real life stuff. Um, and I have no time, like all I do is work full time, write and, and stream. Um, like that's my life. Uh, <laughs> so I'd like a single player mode uh, for people. Not necessarily uh, something that's necessary, but something I'd like to add if I have time. Um, I think uh, for the goals, uh, we're gonna use alarm, uh, like a uh, like a sanity sort of meter style, uh, like the old Call of Cthulhu games or. Uh, Eclipse Phase, uh, some other games like that. Uh, uh, so Alarm can be that, it can also be like some sort of ticking clock with the alarm. Uh, hence why Alarm, right? So there's that. Um, sunlight. Dance and Sunlight are kind of the hard ones, and I've been playing around with a few things in discussion with some other people, uh, specifically my friend Sam, and and we haven't come up with anything perfect yet, but we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna talk that out. I mean, we're gonna talk about this kind of stuff. So, for me, in, in a lot of ways, this is a game about like. Almost a do-it-yourself board game. I'm gonna grab a thing here. Uh, yeah. So we got we got our handy dandy graph paper here. <laughs> I've heard Eternal Darkness was a good game. Uh, I never played it, though. One of my exes was really really into it. Uh, and, and I love that concept. I heard it was really buggy. <laughs> like it did not run well. But I'm absolutely in love with the concept. Absolutely. So, we got graph paper. Now, for me, I was thinking that this game would kind of be a, a, a game that would require dice, a pen, and graph paper. So it'd be almost like, um, Oh, I should have. I have an idea. Uh, yeah, where's my thing? Apps. Oh, I'll find it during the break. We'll do it up. But the concept I was kind of playing with was. A, a, a map drawing game. So you literally draw your map as part as part of the turn. Um, so so yeah, we're gonna uh, just gonna keep writing stuff down as we as we go. Uh, yeah, Let's look this up. Doing fancy things with my software. So new here. So, yeah. So on your turn, you get to draw a map section. Oh, I should blow that up so people can see. Yeah, there you go. But how, how are you going to draw that map, map section? What are the rules or restrictions that you have as a player? Uh, what input do the other players have, other than getting to draw their own map squares on their turn? So a lot of the ways that I was thinking about this was um, randomly generated. Um, so on your turn, you get to roll on a table. And none of this stuff is final, by the way. This is just like these are my these are my thoughts as as we, we go through the concept. 
Um, so rolling on a table, but then you, you're kind of rolling, just just rolling, and and things are happening, and that's not as much fun. So, what if you did something more like a fiasco style roller? Which has a dice pool. Interesting. Yeah. I'll think about that, just Hatter. I'll think about that. Keep it in the back of my mind. Um, I'll even write it down on my sheet. Light versus dark. Cool. So, I was thinking of Fiasco style dice pool. For those of you who don't know, uh, Fiasco, I'll pull it up here right, real quick. Fiasco is a storytelling game um, designed around the concept of uh, playing a story. Uh, there's no combat, there's no. Uh, nothing like that. It's a narrative game, uh, so the players get to uh, get to take part in the narrative design of it. Um, it's pretty cool. Uh, so basically, the idea of Fiasco is that you take a uh, a like three four dice for each player. I think it's four. Uh, you roll them all at the beginning, and then every time. Uh, then you go around the table, and each person takes one die, and that die decides something about the story. Um, so yeah, uh, yeah. Each time someone decides something about the story. So for example, uh, I played one when I was at the convention, and uh, we were on a steamer ship, like the Titanic sort of style thing. Uh, heading from England to America and uh, I played an engineer and an engineer was one of one of the things that that could be selected so uh, like uh, how do I describe this <laughs> it's it's like there was a big dice pool of like five, sixes, ones, twos, all that stuff, like six out of die. And to select something, you had to take one of the die of the type that you selected. So a two stood for something, stood for a relationship between two characters. You select that, and that would be their relationship for the story. Um, which is fine. I don't need to explain Fiasco in super detailed because we're not talking about Fiasco uh, per se. But the idea that I was going with would be that Every, there would be a number of dice for each player. Uh, a number of dice, one for each player. And every turn, you'd ooh, roll all the dice and the player, the active player, let's say, gets first pick. I'm missing, I'm missing. Roll the dice. Then the players each take a die and uh, select something about the room. The active player gets first pick and draws the map.
So yeah, the concept would be. Oh, do I have dice nearby? I might have dice nearby. Eh, anyway, uh, the concept would be uh, if there were four players, it'd be four dice. Uh, the active player would roll the four dice, a uh, four die, four dice, dice, four dice, and uh, they would get first pick. So that, say you got two, three, four, or five. Uh, for example, uh, I pick a four, and on my table of uh, on my table of uh, of rooms, the four stands for a stone room. And then the person to my right goes. They pick a three. Uh, so then that means that there's a magic chest in the room. The next person goes around and picks something. That means there's four exits, uh, or whatever, like, set it up like that. So everyone contributes to how the rooms are designed, and we draw them on the graphic. Right? So that, that's kind of the concept I'm, I'm going with. Because it gives, it takes some of the control out of the active player, as well as giving all the players something to do on every turn, so you're not necessarily just waiting for your turn every time. Um, it changes up how, um, because it's a random table, you don't necessarily need to have a a dungeon master or a game master or anything like that. The players can kind of set the narrative and set what's going on. Um, so yeah, those are that's that's the the main concept uh, uh, I'm going. With. Um, make a new doc here. So then, what's the goal of the players? What are, what are they trying to accomplish? How are they accomplishing this goal? Right? What obstacles do they face? And these are all kind of questions that uh, I want to use to establish what's going on in the game why we're making deci certain decisions, uh, how the game is going to be played, um, and, and, and what's kind of how the players are interacting with each other. So, uh, who are the player characters within the world? Um, what stats, if any? do they have? What do our tables look like? Is there going to be combat? If I could spell, there will be. Uh, when do we roll dice? And I'm not talking about necessarily the map dice, but just dice in general. Uh, what types of rolls are there going to be? Um, software. So, because the theme is technology, and we live in a modern day age, and I also want this game to be accessible, so I had thought, uh, as part of the process, that it would be really cool if uh, you almost had a computer program that could read out the randomized prompts um, and, and, and do that kind of thing where it, it, it could give you more feedback with, with what's going on. It can keep track of the table, certain things like that. Um, that's definitely a... Um, Looking through. Uh, that's definitely a want, not a need. So I'm going to say software audio 
cues here. Um, I think it'd be cool, but at the end of the day, it's, it's not something I think I need for the playability of the game um, at the moment. Uh, but it depends, right? Because because it depends on how the mechanics of the game work. Uh, for example, I'm thinking that uh, it's possible that having less than a certain number of players would make the game unplayable. Um, obviously, a good like you design it so it wouldn't be. But your other option is 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 providing a s providing a way for there to be more players when there's not more physical players uh, through software or through uh, different control setups. Uh, so those are things you can do. Excuse me. Um, a big question: Are the players working together? Or independently? Are they competing against each other? I guess competing will be better here. Uh, how are they interacting with each other? Can you can you mess someone up? Give them setbacks, force them to be behind your goal. Can you um, if 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 you if you work together, if you all win or like if you work together, you all you either all win or all lose. Um, or do you want a game that has a clear winner from the group? Uh, these are decisions we have to make, right? So those are kind of what I've I've been thinking about uh, this kind of stuff. So yeah, we're going to talk about set, and we're going to talk about. Um, stuff like that. Uh, when I was discussing stuff with Sam, um, for me, when you talk about dungeon crawling and that kind of style, you're really talking about a fantasy game. Um, that being said, there are very different types of fantasy, right? Um, you heard my, my talk last week about genres and stuff. There, there are different types of fantasy. Uh, so, if we're going to have a bunch of players who are cartographers, people who make maps, uh, well, cartographers, there we go. That's what the players are going to be. They're going to be cartographers. So if they're cartographers, why are they in the place that they're in? Why are they in a dungeon? Fantasy dungeon crawler cartographers. Um, why are they in the dungeon? Uh, the way I was thinking about it was that they would be uh, sent there by a nearby village to explore. Why would they be sent? Or, in, in the words of Sid Field, what would they be sent there for? Um, and I don't have an answer for that yet, but that's kind of the way I'm thinking about it. Uh, for me, also, uh, I was thinking about it in a way that the sunlight could be their end goal. Like they're trying to escape the dungeon.
So there's certainly that. Um, so the narrative, the narrative that I'm starting to see here, is that uh, cartographer uh, explorers, let's say explorers are trapped underground on an expedition and are forced to escape to the surface. Something like that. So that's what I have in terms of narrative here, setting. Uh, Sam suggested to me that it be uh, post-apocalyptic. Uh, he made a good point about uh, how uh, in, in a post-apocalyptic world, if we if we jump hundreds of years later, um, and society sort of rebuilding itself, but they're built on top of the ruins of the previous society. So really, they'd be they'd be going down into the dungeon, in order to find a map, uh, old technology, technology that doesn't exist anymore, uh, that they can use to better themselves. So, you know, we're, we're starting to see uh, a pattern, of, or we're starting to work the theme and the ingredients back in upon themselves of, of giving us different elements from the same sort of central idea, um, right? So yeah, this is, this is what I'm starting to see. And, um, Go back to my questions here for a sec. So, what's the goal of the player? The goal is the goal of the player right now, as as we've defined it with our setting, is to escape the dungeon. Mm, yeah, let's say that. I mean, another word we could use is ruins. Um, underground ones specifically, but. Rooks. And how do they accomplish this goal? Uh, so what's the goal of the player to escape the unknown underground rooms? Uh, but the other narrative goal of the player is, is to find old technology. How do they accomplish this? by exploring and mapping, right? What obstacles do they face? Well, obviously, dead ends are one. Which means that on our table, I'll make a separate thing here. Uh, I'll open up my questions here on the side. Let's split this more evenly. Open up another doc here called tables. So we know that our table uh, entrances, exits. We know that our table needs to have uh, an option for none. Right? So that's, yeah. 
So they can face dead ends. Uh, traps, maybe? Um, so yeah, I'm gonna open that up here. So then, uh, room contents table. Needs to have option for traps. Oh, well, I mean, here's an, here's an even better idea. Uh, rather than having traps as be part of the room contents, why don't we have a separate trap statement? And if, say, Well, this kind of thinking leads me to believe that uh, all four players would be working against each other. That there, there's conflict going on, right? Um, because the way that I was thinking about this is if you have a traps table, then if someone's in a room with something, you can put a trap there to derail them. Right? Um, so, so that's the way I'm kind of thinking about it at the moment. But we could, we could do both. I mean, you could have a, a, a co-op mode or a team mode. There, there are options. Um, and as seeing as this is an analog game, our options are a little bit different than in like a video game or something like that. We don't have to rely on uh, technological limitations in, in, in different ways. I mean, it just depends. Um, and hopefully we'll make informed decisions, but there's, there's lots of stuff going on, right? So there's that. Um, so then we have other players. As an option, uh, there's an option of putting uh, enemies or monsters. Uh, I'm not sure about that yet, and but certainly doable. Depends how much of a dungeon crawler we're trying to make, right? Are we trying to make it a, a like sort of hack and slash uh, roguelike, or are we trying to uh, like just have an escape thing where they have to fight against the environment? Um, and, and the enemies or monsters don't necessarily have to be other creatures. They could be uh, certain parts of plants or animals or stuff like that, uh, like flora or fauna. Uh, oh, see that thing again. Come on. No, do it. No. Oh, no, there we go. So, uh, is there going to be combat? Is there going to be fight rolls? Uh, or are there other ways? You just have to run from, from the, the enemies. Um, I think combat seems likely. Uh, but it doesn't have to be the only thing. Uh, because it'd be, it'd be interesting to have player versus player combat. Uh, 
Um, but again, not something that's 100% strictly necessary. Um, so then, that means when do we roll dice? Well, you roll dice to generate the map. You possibly also roll dice to in combat. Uh, are we going to have certain? Are certain characters going to have skills that will help them with certain things? I mean, that's an option. You could give certain characters. Uh, the ability to be better at traversing certain types of terrain, or uh, there be a possible terrain that certain characters can can pass because they have skills or, or items or something that allow them to do it. Um, it's a possibility. I'm not saying it has to be there. Um, so yeah, uh, what staff it bring? And and the questions just keep going around and around, right? So what staffs, if any, do they have? Uh, they can have skills, uh, movement, uh, special powers, uh, combat skills, or combat stats, uh, i.e. image or uh yeah damage HP MP that sort of thing um So then that brings up, uh, well, this is the answer to the second page. I'm gonna, I'm gonna fold that out. So that brings up the question of who sets these stats? Is it the player characters? Or is it the players themselves? Are there pre gen? Uh, yeah, pre generated characters? Who sets the the stats and that kind of thing? Um, I like the idea of pre-generated characters, mostly because if you if you have the player set the stats, then there has to be some sort of character creation element, and you need to write rules for that, uh, which is fine, but it's just something to consider, right? Um, I'm going to delete our tables question because we have sort of started on our tables. Um, so now, we started, started asking ourselves some questions, figuring out how, how our game is going to go. Uh, what does a typical turn look like? So obviously, or at least obvious to me, um, you start with movement, then you generate the room, whatever room they're in. Uh, then the player gets action. Does the player get? Um, I don't know yet, but I mean that could be like uh, thinking of a little bit of uh, Munchkin, for example. Search the room. Uh, fight slash combat. Use a skill. Uh, 
an interesting idea I just had. Uh, what if, um, what if instead of, uh, of having a global map, every player makes their own. I mean, in this type of game, uh, for things like search the room, you'd likely roll on a random table. Randomize table. Uh, for combat, uh, is it? Uh, is it competing rolls? Or just a a tackle. So yeah, uh, it's now five to eight. So I'm gonna take a five minute break um, and be back at eight o'clock. Uh, and we're gonna continue on this. Actually, I think for the next part, we're gonna talk a little bit about game design, uh, stuff a little bit more uh, and, and kind of ways of focusing, ways in which we can focus our efforts. Um, because you, you can't make everything perfect. There's just not enough time. Um, like it, and, and your game is going to focus on certain elements. It just is. So, yeah. We're going to go take a break. And uh, we'll come back and talk about that stuff. Cool? Cool.